On today's Visual Studio Toolbox, Richard Campbell joins us to share his thoughts on what technologies and patterns you should be looking at. Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, filling in for Leslie, and I'm very excited today to get to hang out with my good friend, Mr. Richard Campbell. Hello, Richard. buddy. How are you? Good. How are you? Uh, Richard you know Co-host of the iconic .NET Rocks uh, show, as well as Run As Radio. Mm -hmm. uh, you have been around the block several times, so to speak, um, talking with people on a weekly basis who are doing fun and new and interesting things. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to give you a chance to fill us in on some of the things that you think people should have on their radar Um what should developers be looking into, learning, thinking about beyond the usual, you know, of course, .NET 5 and 6 and Blazor and Maui and those types of things. Although some of those things like Maui's a ways away yet. I can't wait to see how cool Maui is, but I'm yeah. not even really comfortable doing our .NET rocks on Maui yet. Like, I'll let it okay. cook a little more. Okay. You know, I, maybe by the end of the, by the end of the year, I'm hopeful because well, they've been trying to crack that yet. problem for a while. .NET six is in preview already, so yeah, future is always here. Yeah, but, and and plunking along. So yeah, I'm, but those yeah, things very, have been, those things have been covered. Um, oh, for sure. And so is the Docker's and the Kubernetes, you know, Kubernetes and that whole. Am I going to go containers? Those yeah. are 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 common thoughts. You know the. Last year, the pandemic impact on software has been really interesting. Over on the IT side of my life in the run as world, I ended up doing a whole separate weekly episode on pandemic related topics for mm -hmm. IT folks. But I think now that we're coming, that series wrapped up because it's become, at least in the IT world, you can't tell the difference between a pandemic related topic and just IT. Like, right. they're kind of the same things now, right? I, it, but I think the big thing you're finding is folks are working from home. They're probably going to keep working from home. And some applications don't work from home well. Yeah. You know, it, it, you can't scale a VPN infinitely. And so say you take an old WinForms app, database still back at the office, but the client's now deployed onto the user's workstation, but now sipping through that VPN pipe, mm -hmm. you know, and multiply that by how many people. And when you're used to a gigabit networking, you know, in the office, uh, you know, 30 megs where the data being hauled down to the machine, just not that big of a deal. But right. you pull all that through VPNs, it gets old fast. Yes, especially if you don't happen to have high speed internet, you know, yeah. not everybody has a gig down. <laughs> yeah, symmetrical gigs, because then, you, you know, you yeah. pulled that data grid down for them to manipulate it. And then you said, I'll oh, just haul the whole thing back. So now the upstream bandwidth matters too. Right. Uh, and, and you ever wonder why those IT guys are so grumpy? It's your fault. <laughs> you did that. <laughs> and so are you, over and over again, we're hearing folks saying, hey, you know, I want to retool this app. I want to look at it a different way. And .NET 5 might be an excuse for that. But really, you're mm -hmm. saying, does the architecture of this app still make sense? Do you really want to rewrite it? And uh, so one of the options, especially when we're talking about that whole forms over data model is, could this be a power app now? You know, whether whether you're dev or you're IT, like ignore power apps at your peril. They seem to be the new, this is the new visual basic, so to speak, in the sense that the main skill you need to bring to the power app tooling is domain expertise. Mm -hmm. And so you think about the old world of visual basic in the 90s, or Fox for that matter, knowing I'm talking to an old Fox friend, uh, it was not a coding intensive. There was coding, but the main thing we were thinking about was, do you know the problem space well? And so we're right. seeing a new generation of domain experts uh, starting to grab a hold of these web-centric, cloud-centric tools and solving automation and productivity problems with them fairly well. And so the idea that you would look at an old WinForms app and think, of, and you're dealing with this problem that's going to push you to let's solve it. It's like, Mm -hmm. Would this be better served by you working closely with some domain experts that depend on it now to actually reach into that power app? I'm not even saying you'd need to write it, that you might just supervise it, give it a little governance and uh, and help them to be a part of, of solving that problem. Because now you're going to get the mobile client, you're going to get uh, uh, out of the VPN entirely and into that cloud-centric model, unless you mm -hmm. want to keep the data back on the premises, there's solutions for that. And if you need to build a few 
uh, APIs to offer up some feature set for that, you can do that too. So isn't it, building APIs, is that a critical piece of this? I mean, the Power App needs to connect to something. You don't just connect it to the database. I assume right. you connect it to a series of services that are written with a particular standard or format. Um, it, it depends on the, the what you're doing and how you're doing it. A lot of these APIs are generatable too. Like they're just not, it's not that complicated. Okay. So you've got to kind of look at where your architecture is right now and what pieces you want to build. You may well need to build some significant level of abstraction. Or perhaps mm -hmm. this is a database that's still running on-prem that they want to move to Azure SQL, but they couldn't because of this app. And right. So you're actually going to untangle that problem by looking at these alternatives. Okay. So it, it, I just think that there's folks' reflexes to keep repeating in, in the same space. And Microsoft's facil facilitating this. I mean, WinForms has gone through several platform shifts since the 90s, right? It was yeah. a VB product. It was a different product in .NET. It's a different product, again, coming into the .NET 5.6 world in the Win SDK version. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily the correct solution anymore. Mm -hmm. Although there's a totally different approach to this problem, too. And it's another one that we certainly came up on Run As Radio as an IT-oriented solution, but it's... Uh, I think devs need to know about this as you're taking responsibility for architecture, which is if it does if it doesn't make sense to rewrite it and not and rewrite it into other tools or re-architect it, like maybe go power apps on it. Or heck, if you were if you're thinking about going .NET 5, like I had great things to say about the folks over at Visual Recode, Mark Rendell and his gang, because they're really providing great, not only great guidance around how mm -hmm. to get to .NET 5. And they'll actually parse your code and give you hints on where you're going to have problems, uh, and consider stuff like how do you get off of the, you know, uh, WCF and onto G, uh, gRPC. Like those right. are all choices there. But what about sticking into the VM? Yeah. So the virtual desktop has taken a huge leap forward in the past couple of years, and so you know your real issue with that WinForms app is that you're pushing the client off premises onto an employee workstation, or, you know, over that thin pipe and back to a database. Mm -hmm. You could put the whole thing back together again in the cloud, still running the original code, but you now provide it as a as a virtual Windows virtual desktop. Right. It's that's an IT solution, but it takes the pain away. So if your IT folks are frustrated with this app, the idea that you can say, "Hey, let's save the dev resources. Maybe we don't need to re-engineer it, but we want to package it differently." You might need to say, change some privileges some rules around some of that code, but mm -hmm. it's a lot less effort to make it run in a Windows virtual machine uh, sure. or virtual desktop than it is to rewrite it in any form. Yeah, because then it's just the same app. Same app. It's also different secure. resources. You know that you're one of the things we have a problem with with these older applications is how is their security perimeter? Now that it's on the employee right. desktop at home, it has more exploit risks. If you're yep. running in that virtual machine, well, one of the things you can do inside that virtual machine is just like, hey, look, you don't browse on that virtual machine. That that virtual desktop is there to run certain applications, and that's it. You, mm -hmm. you need to get on the web, you do that on your own instance. You won't need to work on these internal apps, you do it in that instance. So you can keep that very secure and split that workload. Right. Has there been more thought to uh, keeping the fat client on the local, but then just switching to Azure services and Azure resources and uh, data resources in the back end. I mean, we've that's been talked about over and over again, but is this wound up being a push for that to happen? The modern, yeah, if you will? It depends on how, you know, what's the state of the app? How modern are you? So like the gRPC approach, right? Where you're changing out that back end and using more modern communications certainly leverages that and, and allows that. So you know, not every WinForms app or or even you know WPF app is equal. The even the WebForm scenarios got an interesting challenge there, right? Because that's a pretty tight client server relationship. So, but you mm -hmm. can definitely ship that into the cloud and, and re-engineer pieces of it as you need to. And I'm not gonna say anything bad about any of those technologies. Like they work. If that there's a reason those apps have persisted that long, they're not broken. So mm -hmm. the question is in, in this current model, if they're starting to struggle, can you repackage it? Or if you're going to re-engineer, go all the way. Jump to the modern tools, especially okay. for data over for, on forms. The, that technology is pretty refined now. Okay. What's next? 
uh, you know, not everybody's working for a big company with a pile of old apps. If you're living in the consulting land, uh, we've had these conversations with a, a bunch of folks where it's like, everybody's about digital transformation. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the terms of the opportunity space, it's look for verticals where they haven't taken advantage of cloud and mobile and smartphones. Because there's lots of ways to refrank that work. And often they're struggling with these problems too. And those are good consulting gigs that make, they have very direct ROIs. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things the pandemic has really drilled us into is, is get immediate return on investment. Stay productive and make sure the product you're working on has value. We've, we've been in a very speculative mode for the past decade coming into the pandemic because we were experimenting with new things. There was lots of growth. And that's yeah. a very fun time to write software because you can kind of do everything. We're in a more serious period right now. Not only does the pandemic put challenges, but generally there's economic stress. And software development work doesn't stop. But make sure that your software development work has good ROI. And so in consulting, mm -hmm. often we see small projects shut down because they weren't that important. But good consultants know to how to pick projects that will make that company more money than the cost of the project in a quarter or six months. Right. If you can own those ROI numbers, you'll have as much work as you can stand. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm, the AI space is interesting to me because a lot hmm. of those projects were pretty speculative. And so I did see a wave of folks backing away from AI projects and drilling more on like uh, cloud transformation projects, digital transformation approaches. But there are very practical AI implements that can have huge benefits uh, for organizations. And I think that some of the biggest opportunities there, like it's sexy to look at the image processing stuff and that's certainly viable. Yeah, that's the canonical sample, right? You upload pictures and which one's a cat, yeah. which one's a dog, but- But how does that help makes, a business? Makes a great demo, but what's the yeah. business use case for distinguishing between cats and dogs? You're exactly right. And so the challenge with using image recognition is it's a business process workflow change. Mm -hmm. And you can do that because there's big returns on that. But so I often say to someone, how would you use a QR code in your organization? Like, how could you help a customer utilize a product better? Because if you can't make sense of that, you're not thinking about the image workflows that way, that you don't mm -hmm. even need to go down recognition, then you haven't thought enough about it yet. Right. right. The classification and so forth, those are, are very complicated bits of tech. And but you have to rethink the workflows in a big way. Easier returns on the tech side. So, you know, take a look at, at reducing tier one tech support load with a bot. Mm. Right. You can you mm -hmm. can jump into social media now and add support through the, the Facebooks and the Twitters and things like that with sort of smart bots. And the, the bot framework is amazing. It's you know, it's it's cheap. It uses some Azure on the back end. Yeah. You can start with a, just feeding it a fact to answer questions from there and tune it up from there. Yeah, it seems you, like half the websites I go to, I show up on the website, I'm looking for something and the, hey, would you like to chat? Hey, do you want to talk to me? Yeah. Try you not know, to maybe, be annoying about it. That maybe would help. <laughs> after I find out if you actually have what I'm looking for in the first place, maybe we can then have a conversation. So it's it can get a little bit overdone, but it's a very... It can be a very good idea. Yeah, one of the things I've been suggesting to folks a lot, and this is again not my my thought. I was fed to me is take take advantage of sentiment analysis first. Mm -hmm. Look at how people are expressing themselves. You know, it's really interesting. Start to classify uh, tweets and incoming emails with a sentiment analyzer. Mm -hmm. How angry are people? Right. And if you want to see how good your bot is running, run sentiment analysis on what people are typing to the bot. Because if they're getting progressively angrier, your bot is not helping you. Right. And then well, potentially even think about putting a timer on it. So how long does it take people to shut it down from the time it shows up? If it turns right. out that 90% of the people close it within a second or two, that gives you a hint as to yeah. whether or not people are viewing it as useful or just in the way. Well, let's start with a test of if they haven't been on, if it's up there within the first minute of someone being on the site, you're just going to drive them off the site. Right. And you can instrument that. But if they've yeah. been there for 10 minutes and are still just clicking around randomly, yes. maybe mm -hmm. you can yep. offer some information. Right. And in fact, why not do some analytics on how people are navigating your site first? Because maybe mm -hmm. the chat bot's a crutch for bad navigation in the first place. Right. Or you know Yeah. Or potentially anticipate why they're here. Oh, you're here because you wanted to check on your order. 
Hey, yeah. well, hey, Richard, welcome. By the way, your order shipped yesterday. Right. That's pretty useful. Yeah. How about delighting people with your site? Because yeah. you can do that. Right. Uh, you know where all this tech actually lives, uh, especially for the average .NET developer? ML.NET. I think mm -hmm. it's one of those libraries that don't get enough love. Yeah. Like Azure Cognitive Services, we've done a few shows on it, and it's awesome. And it's API driven. You can program in any language you want. It works great. But if you're happy in .NET and you may or may not want to use Azure, you want to consume it in different ways, ML.NET gives you all the choices in the world. Yep. Just understand if you don't use Azure on the back end, you're committing compute resources to doing those analytics. Right. So you might want to do it against the cloud at first and have an option not to, like, but you have that flexibility. But the sample set of ML.NET is astonishing. And they're all things you could put to work in a reasonably short amount of time to show direct value to the organization. Yep. Cool. All right. We got time for one more. You want to do a little future stuff? Like what's yes. not what you not do today, but you know, things I keep my eyes on going yeah. forward. Absolutely. My on my radar all of the time for the past few years is what's going to disrupt the smartphone. Now, when I talk about the smartphone, I'm not talking about any given product, but I'm recognizing that what's actually happened in the past 10 years with the smartphone is that we've generally converted every adult human in this planet into a cyborg, right? <laughs> we've added a digital extension to everyone that mm -hmm. allows them to communicate anywhere in the world, as long as they don't care how much it costs, and to have access to information, whether good quality or bad quality, separate conversation. More importantly, it gives people an opportunity to ignore others and not have to interact. Well, there's that, or to interact with them through the device rather than face-to-face, yeah. -face, because, you know, that's pandemic. right. But when I watch a, uh, a farmer in Uganda reference his smartphone to decide when to plant, mm -hmm. like, listen, the smartphone's penetrated the whole planet. Right. So now that we have created this digital extension to ourselves with a slab of black glass, the question for a developer keeping your eye out is what replaces it? What comes next? Mm. Because it's in, it's largely been static. You know, phones were kind of fun in the early 2000s. They had keyboards, slide out, pop up, you mm -hmm. know. Since the iPhone, it's been a slab of black glass. I mean, it gets bigger, it gets smaller, it has two cameras, it has three cameras. Yeah. Like, how many cameras do you need? Like... But fundamentally, it's the same device over and over again. It's been refined and it's spread widely. Ooh, disrupting it is a next generation device that represents huge opportunities for development. My current leading candidate are the visors. Now, I'm not going to pick HoloLens 2 automatically, although I think it's an extraordinary device. But there are many companies working on something you wear on your face that does everything a smartphone can do and more. Hmm. Uh, we could talk about the social constructs, about is it appropriate to wear things on your face? And I would argue the moment a product is good enough, you don't care what you look like. Once upon a time, walking around with a phone out was not socially acceptable either. Sure, sure. Um, and they're not good enough yet, but they're getting there. Okay. I'm looking at the industrial implementations that are happening in HoloLens 2 right now, and it reminds me of the BlackBerry in like 1997. Yeah. Right when you back when Blackberries were very expensive, they were already selling a thousand dollar phone ten years before the iPhone was a thousand dollar phone, and they had huge back end infrastructures behind them. Only large enterprises could operate them, but the value they offered was so great, enterprises did it, and that's kind of where we are with these smart visors right now. Big organizations doing significant implementations because it has large value and it's expensive and it's worth it. So not a consumer mm. product yet. Yeah. But for those that are immersing themselves in the market, right now the coding models are hard. It's tricky to work in 3D, and it's tricky mm -hmm. to do eye tracking and to really utilize the hardware. But as that moves into more mainstream, we're going to need a tremendous amount of code. It's a detonation of the user interface. You know, right. We're fundamentally still doing screens, mice, keyboards, touch, right? We've, yep. And we've unified that. Initially, mobile was on its own. Then tablets came along and made it complicated. Now we've kind of unified the model for all of those things. Yep. But those models don't work once it's a 3D interface on your face with gestures and voice. That's really yep. tricky. So I'm looking to what are the skills you hone? Well, you know, what's worth working on so that when that market explodes, you get to ride it. And uh, I always pay attention to Unity. C-sharp yep. you know, wins again. And, and it's very simple way of approaching 3D. 
And I think staying current, I do expect .NET to be there just because they're versatile and be able yep. to move fast, whether it's Microsoft's hardware, someone else's. So those are, are viable skills for that as well. But you in gotta general- imagine it. Yeah, you gotta imagine at some point the UI will be easier to do. Yeah, and somebody's gonna sit down and find an interesting UI in that. But do you think about what are power apps in the in the 3D world, right? Yeah. There'll be an abstract, a fully abstracted tool for that 80% case, the simple blocks of work. Mm -hmm. And I, I can imagine those things happening, but you'll just have to key, keep an eye on it and, and be involved one yeah. way or the other. It's challenging to get HoloLens projects right now. There are only a few organizations doing it. And we know a few folks that are working on that sort of stuff. But the opportunity space, you know, in terms of disruptive, that to me is one of the largest single disruptors out there. I could go on, but I think we're out of time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we want to keep this, keep this. Uh, we could talk all day. Yeah. Um, love to have you back and, ha and have this conversation again in a little bit. Sure. Well, my opinions change as I learn more. Thanks so much for coming on. Hope you guys enjoyed that. And we will see you next time on Visual Studio Toolbox.